Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw, when you say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the street and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and the daughters of music are brought low, also they are afraid of heights and terrors in the way, when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the street. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosened, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Thank you, Brother Jed. I asked him to read that. He read from the New King James Version, and if I make references here, it will probably be in the regular King James. But I've entitled this um, sermon from the first verse, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. I found in going through this sermon that while I'm directing this at young people, I think you will see that it will have to do with all people, even the older folks. We know that these words were written originally, of course, as all the Bible was, by God with the human hand, thus employing his knowledge and wisdom was Solomon, the wise king. And if you look at verse 3 of chapter 2, you'll see that it was written to show what is good for man to do. In fact, you can look at the whole of the first uh, chapter or so, a couple of chapters, and you'll see that emphasized in various ways. Notice, first of all, and we'll just look at that first verse, notice that the very first word is remember. You remember in the account our Lord gave of the rich man of Lazarus in Luke 16 that one of the things Abraham said in the Hadean world to the rich man was, Remember. We also understand that the Bible itself is full of material that says we had better remember when it comes to what God and His Word has taught us. We want to think about memory for a moment. I think that you can say generally defined that it is a faculty of the heart, a mental faculty with which God has enabled us, He has endowed us, and in so doing caused us to be able to recall experiences that we find that to be a wonderful thing is true and yet it can be a very bad thing when you think of your memory it can be like maybe a great art gallery of pictures in which hang in your life all of the things or scenes of your life and each experience is another picture added to the great memory gallery. We must view the pictures that we hang in that gallery. There are various things we could compare to help us appreciate the faculty of memory. The Bible places great emphasis on memory. After the great flood of Noah's day, God set a rainbow in the sky and said, that will always remind you that I will never again destroy the world by water. 
Under the law of Moses, there was the Passover feast, Exodus 13, that was instituted while they were yet in Egypt. And when God destroyed the firstborn of all those in Egypt, he made a way where he would pass over the firstborn of Israel by the exercise of their faith in keeping the commandment to kill a pure lamb and to take its blood and put it on the lintel and doorpost. And he passed over Israel. And when you look at other things in the scriptures, you can see there were a number of things designed to aid the memory of the Israelites. In the New Testament of the Christ, we're told to keep a number of things in memory. Paul, in speaking to the elders at uh, Ephesus, in Acts 20, and I think specifically at verse 35, referred to them remembering the word that had been preached to them. Paul even referred to Timothy, the young preacher, telling him to remember certain things. Peter said to Christians, this second epistle, Beloved, I now write unto you, in which both I stir up your pure minds, by way of remembrance. And then in the Lord's Supper a few moments ago that we partook of, we did it in memory of Jesus Christ, and such is even put on the table that normally serves to hold the emblems. So we must have things in our minds that are correct if we're to remember correct things. If you noticed in a song that we sang a while ago, 447, Lead Me to Calvary, notice that the chorus, Lest I Forget Gethsemane, Lest I Forget Thine Agony, Lest I Forget Thy Love for Me, Lead Me to Calvary. So we're surrounded by things that helps us remember. We probably don't realize how many of these aids are around us till you really stop and go to counting them. But we do that all the time. There are those memories that tempt us. And this happened to the Israelites after they were freed from Egyptian bondage. They didn't remember the hardness and the terrible life they lived. But when it got tough out there and they had nobody... Uh, giving them, for them, what they now had to supply for themselves, they remembered the flesh pots and it tempted the Israelites to go back to Egypt. There are those who look back on the world and the ease of it because they have a cross to bear to be faithful to the Lord and they're reminded of sinful pleasures when things are easy and they yearn to go back to it. Our Lord said, no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. So here are things we should put out of our minds and not remember, at least to the point, that will they encourage us to go back into those sins. These memories can really serve to torture us. I can't help but believe when Abraham told the rich man in torment, Son, remember, in thy lifetime you had your good things and Lazarus' evil things, and now he is comforted and thou art tormented. All of the great opportunities that avail themselves he had neglected. And so it is that in every one of the pictures of the judgment and the parables the Lord gave, he shows people lost because of what they neglected to do, sins of omission. When you think of Joseph's brothers who sold him into slavery, their memory of that all those years troubled them, Genesis 42, 21. When Herod, in a drunkard stupor, had made a foolish and stupid promise to give Salome whatever it was she asked after her enticing dance, then, of course, her mother got her to ask for John the, head, John the Baptist head on a charger. And she did, and that tortured him a long, long time. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed our Lord, so tortured him in his memory of what he did and that he betrayed innocent blood, Matthew 27, 3 through 5, that he committed suicide. And thus we see how memory can torture you. But at the same time, it can bring great peace and joy 
It did to Paul, according to what he said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, concerning Timothy's upbringing, his knowledge of the young man, his faith in God and his actions, proving that faith. The memory of a life of service can bring great joy to us. Thus, as this is addressed in verse 1 of chapter 12 in Ecclesiastes, to the young people, that ought to begin to tell us, as young as you possibly can, begin to have those life actions that will always give you joy. Then he says, remember thy creator. We need to stop and pause to remember the one who created us and made us and put us here and understand why he put us here. We need to remember our very bodies, our hands and our ears and our eyes and our feet, all are wonderfully made and designed by God to work on this earth for the time that we're here. And when you think of all the material things, all of nature, how it was all prepared for us here on this earth. Now God did that for us. God made all of my mental faculties. He made my conscience. As I said earlier, He gave us the ability to learn and be able to recall events in life. He gave us our wills to choose to serve Him. He did not make us to be robots to where we had no choice. We just did as He said because that's all we could do. His great love is manifested to us in that He did that. He gave us free moral choice. He gave us our intelligence. And we use that even in this world to make things better for us here and how we have been the recipients of those things and to subdue the earth. He created us not just fleshly or material, but He created an inward man, your soul, your spirit, and it will live forever. It will never cease to exist. He has provided everything temporal and eternal in the sense that He can take care of the soul. It's all designed for that. Our Lord, our God, has given us His Son. He's given us the Christ. He's given us His Word. And He's given us the church that Jesus built and purchased with His blood, to which He adds all the saved to believe and obey the gospel of God's power to save us. And He tells us that He surely has done all those things and given them to us. He tells us heaven is out there for all those who will love Him and live their lives keeping His commandments. So we must stand before that Creator then and give an account of the deeds done in the body because it's all been given to us. We did not do it ourselves. It's all been given to us. And thus as stewards over the things God's given to us, then He wants us to realize we must use all these things according to His will. He says, remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. That's before the evil days come. Now what does he mean by the evil days? He's talking about the days when you're fully responsible for your life and for your family. He's talking about the days when you begin to live life responsible for yourself and the lives of others and your family. The days when trouble will come one way or the other, while the most faithful children of God can expect persecution because they are faithful. When sorrow and grief come. A lot of people just aren't prepared for that. One of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons marriage break up is that nobody wants to stand the responsibility that somebody else in your life, a husband or a wife, brings to you. And especially when children come along. They don't want to sacrifice their independence and in doing as they please. Because let's face it, we live in a very self-willed and selfish world. The days when the bitter dregs of the cup of pleasure are reached... No, if you remember Him in your youth, you'll begin to form your life in your youth according to the pattern of God's Word. Now, why remember Him now? Well, again, 
the power of sin gets firmer, a firmer hold on one as he grows older. You begin to practice your life and mold yourself without any knowledge of God's will. And thus, if later in life you're exposed to the truth, it's a lot more difficult to uproot all of those things that are wicked after they've been practiced for many, many years. That's not the case if you start in your youth to serve God, for you are forming those good habits of the study of His will, prayer, and practicing those things that Christians do. Also, one might realize to begin to serve God in your youth, you have a much longer period of service on this earth, usually. And this helps us to avoid the remorse of later years when people will say, I just wish I had known the truth when I was a child rather than having learned it. After so many mistakes and sins were committed and bad habits started and practiced for so many years. Your life, by starting early in your youth and serving God faithfully, will be at peace more, will be happier. In fact, it will be happier regardless of how long you live. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. When the evil days, while the evil days come not, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So when you start early, and you form good habits of loving the truth, of correcting your life according to the truth, of choosing your mate that will help you go to heaven on the basis, of course, of the truth of God's Word, it makes a great deal of difference. In fact, if you live to be 70, 80, 90, 100 years old, you will be able to look back over your life and be so happy that you lived all those days in submission to the God who loved you and made this whole world for you and yet even made the world to come for the faithful. But there's regrets in a lot of people's lives. In fact, a lot of people just don't live as long because they didn't choose to serve God in their youth. They get involved in all sorts of sins and it leads to their early demise. If nothing else, it tends to cause things to get into your life because you didn't know the truth and exercise your life according to godliness that handicapped you even later when you obey the truth. We might say when we remember now our Creator in the days of our youth, we're helping prepare for the winter days of life. We're preparing ourselves, if you want to put it this way, for old age. We are going down the valley one by one. We're all headed toward the setting sun and none of us know when the sun's going to set on our lives. When the faculties of our minds and our bodies often fail and will fail, for then, let's go through the rest of the chapter, the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, the superior powers which rule in our bodies as the heavenly luminaries are in the world, the understanding and the reason, the imagination and the memory, these by age may become obscured as when the clouds come between us and the sun and all the lights of the great firmament God made. In the earlier season of life, the days of our youth, the clouds of affliction having poured down all of their rain upon us, they pass away and the sunshine succeeds. But now, in old age, the clouds return after the rain. Old age itself is with the wicked a continual sorrow. And there's no longer any hope of fair weather. In other words, there comes that time when after a lifetime of getting sick and getting well, where you get sick and you don't get well. And nobody gets well over old age. The keepers of the house, the arms and the hands which are made to guard and defend the body, they begin to shake. And they, get, they begin to tremble. 
and it won't make any difference how many good diets that you partook of all through the years and how many miles you ran every day. You can prolong for bodily exercise. Paul said, profiteth a little. But you'll still reach those days. Maybe because of that exercise, you won't reach them at 60, but you'll reach them at 75 or 80 or 90, and that's all good. But my point is, no matter how well you live your fleshly life and take care of your life, you're going to die. We're going down the valley one by one. We sometimes forget that, but that's one of the things our memory should call to mind. Every day we live, we come closer to the end of our days and the end of opportunity, the end of growing up in Christ and learning to shape and mold our lives like Him. He talks about the strong men, the shoulders where the strength of the body's placed. And were once able to bear a great weight. Now they begin to stoop. They begin to bow themselves. He talks about the grinders. I often have laughed about that in reference to the teeth. And of course, I may pause here and say in all these areas, due to modern medicine and treatment, uh, we have a great blessing from what the people of his day had, but they still all wear out. The grinders, the teeth, begin to fall away and cease to do their work because they're few. Also, those that look out of the windows and are darkened. The eyes, the windows of the soul through which we look at all things abroad, they become dim. And he that used them is as one who looks out of a window at night. Anybody that's experienced uh, cataracts and things like that know that that goes along with age and many other eye problems that hinder sight. The doors are shut in the streets. Well, there are difficulties and obstructions that attend all the passages of the body. Digestion changes. We become weak in so many ways when the grinding is low. The youthful and healthy sleep very soundly. In most cases, normally, But, you'll see as you get older, sometimes it doesn't work quite that way. Things begin to change with the dilapidation of the body. So we rise up at the voice of a bird or at the crowing of the cock. And we don't know why, because we didn't go to sleep till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and here we are awake at 6. We ever notice teenagers, they go to sleep. And can sleep through thick and thin and all day long. And when they get up, they still want to sleep. The daughters of music are brought low. The voice begins to fail. Maybe it becomes hoarse, but at least it fails in some way. The hearing, why it becomes dull. And the vocal cords are not as active as they once were. And you hate to admit it, but you have to. You're getting old. The power of harmony doesn't exist like it used to. Thus the old sometimes are seen sitting in heaviness, hanging down their heads, as one person said, as, as virgins drooping under the sorrow of captivity. Old age being inactive and helpless makes one, or at least it works toward this, to be afraid. Because it's not going to be like it used to be. There's no going back. You become afraid of that which is high. You become afraid of falling. You become afraid of climbing because there's danger in that when it comes to falling. You're becoming unfit to endure physical hardships of fatigue. In fact, uh, along with all of us older folks, you like peace and quiet a whole lot more. And you don't like to have to start things new. You like to settle into a certain way of doing things and you don't want to do otherwise. I might pause here and say that you may get physically old, but you don't have to be old. 
I want to say that again, Brother Buddy. You're going to get physically old, but you don't have to be old. The temptations of the aged are not necessarily the temptations of youth. Paul warned Timothy about the temptations of youth. And I've often pointed out, uh, when you get older, you're still going to be tempted as long as you're in possession of your faculties and accountable to God for your thoughts and actions. Uh, but you may just want to quit doing anything. You may just want to not be involved. You just don't want to deal with another problem. Well, you've got to rise up and move on. And just like you resisted and fought against the temptations of youth, now you have to fight against the temptation of age. Fears which are in the way discourage the old from getting outside, doing a lot of things they used to do. Then the almond tree flourishes. The hair of the head becomes white as the early almond blossoms in the land. I've been out in California in the valley and seen these almond groves. They were blooming. It's just like snow. And then maybe a wind will blow through there and a lot of the blooms fall off and it looks like it snowed on the ground. Well, there's snow on the mountain and sometimes snow on the ground. But nevertheless, it's going to be snow somewhere or you're going to be dead. And death is coming for we're going down the valley one by one. The grasshopper becomes a burden. The legs once light and uh, nimble. You're able to, like Superman, leap tall buildings with a single bound, or you thought you could. It's not that way anymore. You used to, with ease, to bear the weight of the whole body. But now that body's become a burden. Sometimes you scarcely can carry yourself along. Desire fails along with them, for nothing is desirable when nothing can be enjoyed. And that's one of the things you have to work on when you get older. The silver cord, the nerves whose coat is white and shining as a cord of silver, is loosed and no longer does uh, the office of work that they once did. I took many years ago in a graduate course, a geriatrics course. And what they did in those days, uh, trying, and I guess they still do it, to get you to see things and to perceive things with your body as somebody who might be 90 years old. They said, put tape over your fingers. Get glasses that are rather thick and dim and stick things in your ears and then try to feel and see and hear. And then you begin to empathize a little bit but the person who through natural falling away in the flesh have those things. The picture, the circulation of the blood, that all makes a difference as you get older. <laughs> Young people a lot of times, well, we all have been there too, you know, look at older folks and they say, well, I just can't figure out why so and so it's like that. All I can do is say, pray to God that you live long enough and you'll experience it. That's just the way it works. But be sure you obeyed your God and practice doing His will from your youth up. And you start looking forward to the glorified resurrected body. And for the promise of glory in heaven. When you'll have a body fitted for eternity even as this body is fitted temporarily for this life. All these things can work to help all of us long and yearn for eternity in the presence of God in a body that's like our Lord's. He talks about or the watering wheel, the circulating with its buckets, which you've seen these things where they're turning, picking up the water and moving it over here and its buckets on a wheel. It fills and empties at the same time. But now that the cistern's broken, it could be the verses describing uh, the very functions of life. The very functions of life taken from a well where a cord, a bowl or bucket with which the water's drawn. A wheel by which it is easier to raise. A cistern into which it may be poured. And a pitcher or some kind of vessel 
to carry it away. But now all are broken or loosened or they become useless. And you know what happens when you finally get to a given point with the body going the way it goes? Well, the only thing that can happen. You die. So you, you die and your lungs cease to function, the heart ceases to beat, the blood doesn't circulate, and thus you see the watering wheel. Every vessel becomes useless. The silver cord is loose, the golden bowl is broken, the pitcher and the wheel are still. Then the body returns to the dust and the soul to God who gave it. And we're told by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we're going to be judged according to the deeds done in this body that is rapidly decaying and heading for the time where it will not function biologically and thus cannot house the spirit any longer. And we go the way of all flesh. We're going down the valley one by one. Such are the evil days which come upon many when their youth is spent in sin and pleasure of this world without any regard to God and His will. And thus they're preparing not only for the death of this body, but for eternal death in the devil's hell because they never sought God in this life. So I'm imploring the young people here, and by that I, I think of physically young teenagers in your 20s, in your 30s, and every year I get older, the youth gets older. Start as early as you're capable of starting to love God and keep His commandments and do everything you can to form that. Those of us who have had our children grow up and now our grandchildren growing up, look back on our lives and say, why it was just yesterday. It was just yesterday that we were expecting our children. It was just yesterday that we held them by the hand. It was just yesterday that they were growing up in the home. In reality, it's been 40 years, or 50 years, or 60 years. If there's anything we can do for anybody in our family or out, it's to get them to realize that the earliest you can cultivate a love for spiritual things and learn the gospel and from the heart obey it with the determination to live the rest of your life, however long or brief it may be, in full faithful service to God, then you've done what you ought to do. That's what we ought to be labeled to doing. You young people with your babies, they're on your toes right now, as an elderly lady told me when our children were little. Someday they will be on your heart, though they won't be on your toes. I know some are expecting and some have little ones and various whatevers. That's going to disappear quicker than you think it will. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, or the days draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And at the end of this chapter, he closes with what we quote most often. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The last verse sometimes doesn't get quoted as much as the 13th verse. For he says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Are you a Christian today? If you're young and not a Christian, what in the world is stopping you from doing that? You don't have to be somebody living like a lot of these characters out in Hollywood, a, a rank, wicked lust of the flesh life. But know this, when you're accountable for your actions, then you will have sinned or transgressed God's law. 
Thus you're separated from Him. You know, it doesn't look like much to say that because you ate of a fruit that God said you shouldn't eat of, that it should separate you from God. Remember, Adam and Eve weren't guilty of, of just outright telling lies and fighting and all of those wicked things worldly people do. They just simply didn't take God at His word in the prohibition given them regarding that fruit in the garden. Thus, when you reach your teen years, all things being equal, you're accountable to God for your actions, and thus you sin for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Don't think that you have to become a murderer or a thief before you separate from God. So if you need to obey the gospel, recognize it, be honest with yourself, and know that the way of righteousness is set out in the gospel. Also, don't think you can get your life in order before you become a Christian. You cannot grow up in Christ till you get into Christ. And thus, do you want to grow to become more like Christ? Fine. Get rid of all those sins that are separating you from Him. Get Him to forgive you. And He, he wants to forgive everybody. But He'll forgive you when you from the heart obey the truth and believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ and being baptized for the remission of sins. If you haven't done that now, let me ask you. Are you remembering as you ought your Creator in the days of your youth while the evil days come not, nor the days draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. In fact, if you know what you ought to do and you don't do it, then you're cultivating a mind that will get easier and easier to set aside the doing of God's will. If you're a child of God and you've wandered from Him by sin, then repent of those sins. Come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. If privately done, take care of it there. If done to bring reproach on the church by the sin you committed, then publicly confess it and we'll pray with you and for you and God will forgive. Remember now thy Creator. We're all going down the valley one by one. And the sun's going to set usually the time when we least expect it. Come to Jesus while we stand and sing.